greatest drama, the memorable story of the great among us, written by you, the people. This chapter, I shall return. The story of General Douglas MacArthur. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. What are an old soldier's memories after a half century of service to his country? The day back in 1899 when he entered West Point. The classrooms where he won the highest grades ever achieved in the military academy. Or his graduation, the outstanding cadet of his class. The famous Rainbow Division of World War I, which Douglas MacArthur created and led to France. The day in 1918, when he led his men to victory at Chateau Thierry. Twice wounded, MacArthur received the Distinguished Service Cross from General Blackjack Pershing. And a medal from the French with the traditional kisses. After the war, Superintendent of West Point, the youngest general in the history of the Army. Douglas MacArthur inspired the graduating classes with his spirit. The progress of the man's life is punctuated by a series of culminations of which for you today is one. That spirit is a guarantee of fortitude, of vigor, of victory. Young comrades in arms, happy landings, and God be with you. The next step to the very peak of the military ladder, Douglas MacArthur, a four-star general and army chief of staff. You were 55 years old now, and the army had nothing more to offer, nowhere to go but down. But you were at the peak of your physical and mental powers. A great soldier, you wanted to continue your career. Asked by President Quezon to organize the Philippine Army, you accepted eagerly. You had spent years in the Philippines as a young man. Now you were returning a field marshal. Manila, 1937. Here in middle age, you marry Jean Faircloth. She brought your greatest gift, a son. Meanwhile, you strove to create a modern army from raw Filipino recruits. But the Japanese didn't permit you to complete the task. They struck at Pearl Harbor. A few hours later, it was Manila's turn. Your adopted land was in flames. The war you had predicted was underway. Retreat from Manila to Bataan. From Bataan to Corregidor, the heartbreaking road of defeat. Here on the rock in Manila Bay, you met your darkest hour. Ordered by Roosevelt to proceed to Australia, you refused to go. You had sworn to defend the Philippines. How could you leave your troops in their hour of crisis? But the senior officers insisted, and finally you consented to leave. To General Wainwright, summoned from Bataan, you made a solemn promise. I shall return. Miss MacArthur left the Philippines reluctantly with a burning resolve. He would return. By PT boat and flying fortress, on to Australia. In Australia, General MacArthur expected to find a huge American army, an army he would lead to the relief of the Philippines. Instead, he found a handful of troops and few planes. Australia was threatened with invasion. MacArthur didn't wait for the enemy assault. 
In typically daring fashion, he struck first. Fort Moresby, New Guinea, 1942. The first step in MacArthur's bold and brilliant strategy of island hopping. The strategy worked. Victory at Fort Moresby. The beginning of the long road back to the Philippines. With coordinated land and sea forces, the generals struck again and again during the next two years, hitting the Japanese with shattering speed and power. MacArthur personally directed the invasion of the Admiralty Islands. break the Japanese grip on Hollandia, another island stronghold. Then the greatest prize of all, Leyte Island in the Philippines. The last savage battle for the capital city of Manila fighting from door to door, paying for every captured street with dead and wounded. The pitiful price of war. Then glorious victory. Douglas MacArthur had kept his promise. He had returned to the Philippines. In Manila, deeply moved, he said, God has indeed blessed our arms. My country has kept the faith. Joyous church bells told the news of Philippine liberation, and later the news of Japan's surrender to the Allies. On the deck of the battleship Missouri, MacArthur accepted the Japanese capitulation. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. The enemy signed. This indeed was your hour. Tokyo, 1948. You're a five-star general now, supreme commander of occupation forces. Your task, to convert Japan to democracy. At home, you were boomed for the Republican presidential nomination. Your home state, Wisconsin, was the first test. In the vote for convention delegates, the people turned thumbs down. Then Korea, and a new call to arms. MacArthur responded with lightning speed to the North Korean attack. MacArthur's counterstroke, an amphibious landing at Incheon to take the Reds by surprise from the rear. A brilliant maneuver, it changed the course of the war overnight. Tanks and troops swarmed ashore in one of the great military strokes of all time. MacArthur's troops smashed north to the Yala River, but there they met disaster. Red China entered the war. Hit by Chinese armies, United Nations forces fell back over the snow to the 38th parallel. Then another bombshell. In the White House, former President Truman explained his decision. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea and to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. Shocked and hurt, the MacArthur family started home. General Ridgway, representing the Army of Occupation, 
bade them a sad farewell. Homeward bound for the first time in 14 years, returning apparently in disgrace. But in San Francisco, the plane was met by cheering crowds. The sorry homecoming was transformed into an ovation for a hero. From San Francisco to Washington, a triumphal procession that reached a climax as General MacArthur answered Harry S. Truman before a joint session of Congress. I felt that military necessity in the conduct of the war made necessary, first, the intensification of our economic blockade against China. Two, the imposition of a naval blockade against the China coast. Three, removal of restrictions on air reconnaissance of China's coastal areas and of Manchuria. I now close my military career and just fade away. An old soldier who tried to do his duty as God gave him the light to see that duty. Goodbye. No more would the general lead Americans into battle, but no amount of criticism will ever dim the glory of his valorous record. Douglas MacArthur will not be forgotten. us again next week at this time when the greatest drama, true film biographies of the great among us, again comes your way.